My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCann.com. Welcome to this very special episode of Digital Oil & Gas. I'm delighted today to be uh, joined by um, what who has become quite a good friend, I'd have to say, Paul Boucher, who is the voice narrator for Bits, Bites & Barrels, uh, the uh, my book from uh, published earlier this year. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Privilege. And um, so uh, the uh, putting an audiobook together was a no- new experience for me. I don't think it was a new experience for you as you're a specialist in the world of voice narration. And so what, what I wanted to talk through today, though, for the benefit of uh, those listening, was the process of putting an audiobook together. It, it's not something everyone is going to uh, – a few people will have – as uh, the occasion to do, if you have to first write the book, and then you have to actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah that would be the harder part. That, I think. That, yeah, it may very well be. Um, but but let's begin by uh, you know I'm I'm very curious about your background, and I'm sure the uh, those listening would, would be equally curious. How does someone get into the world of uh, leveraging just their voice and making a living out of that? So how do, how did you get into this work? How did you get started? Well, there's more than a little bit of luck involved, but there's also uh, a few different kind of trajectories that lead you to this. Um, You can be a film or stage actor, um, and that often will lead to, hey, you've got a terrific voice. Why don't you come in and do some of that? And in my case, I was a broadcaster uh, for 23 years. And uh, and when I finally got to Calgary after, I'm trying to remember how many years it was. It was, I guess it was about seven or eight years. Um, That was my first opportunity where somebody said, hey, you don't happen to be bilingual with that name Boucher, do you? And I said, well, yeah. Oh, we have some corporate narration we have to do for, at that time, it was uh, Revenue Canada, but it was now it's CRA. And so off I went. And uh, that was the beginning of a network for me that has grown into a worldwide clientele. I've, I've been really privileged to do work for uh, Marvel when I do DVD release trailers for movies. Um, I really? For Disney, for you're NASA. Like a, you're, you're a voice on, 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 on things that people would hear for entertainment, not just corporate work. Absolutely. Uh, right. And you right now, I think across English Canada and uh, let me see, I guess it would be Marks uh, in the U.S. If you are subjected to training at uh, Disney or GE or MetLife or Harley Davidson, there's a good chance that I've taught you how to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a very entertaining and uh, illuminating and educative ride for me. Where did you, so you said you started out as a broadcaster. Was that in television or radio or something? What would that be? Uh, it was all radio. I, you wind up almost doing some incidental television, but for me, mm. it was radio starting in uh, Kapuskasing in Northern Ontario, which is my hometown. Mm. And then um, in a fairly rapid succession, Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, because why not? Uh, Grand Prairie, then Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, Saskatoon, Calgary, Montreal, and then back to Calgary. Oh, right. So you're a world traveler, a bit like me, I think. Oh, well, it's, it's the way, yeah, actually, it's our, our travels would have resembled themselves and probably for similar reasons in that you you have an opportunity and you really do need to relocate to get mm. it, right? So how the uh, how, how does the, um, the, how the process of book uh, 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 work uh, unfolds is that I, I, on my side, I went looking for a voice and um, I had, I listened to uh, sample tracks from I, probably a dozen different voices. The first first decision we needed to make, uh, Rachel Goyden and I, Rachel's my co-author, we needed to make was would we use a female voice or a male voice? And we, we struggled with this. We couldn't come up with a logical reason to go one way or the other. Uh, and uh, but uh, you know our our um, our biases uh, uh, and to just to, to be blunt about it, we said well most of the people who we know working in the oil and gas industry tend to be male. Um, and, um, uh, so let's go, let's go with that. And, um, uh, but there was no other basis to do that. I don't know if male, female comes to mind, but if have people actually spoken to you about, you know, the, the reasons why they need or wanted a male voice or does it ever come up? Uh, it does come up and it's a bit more of a sensitive subject now. Oh yeah. I think that it sensitive. ever has been for all kinds of really good well, reasons, but. Well, we really, we really argued about it. Like we had a real con, like a, so what do we do? Like, we don't want to be, we don't want to be, we wanted to make sure we didn't have our own bias in the way. So. 
Yeah. No, and I have female peers who have done some narrations or have kind of struggled mm-hmm. with um, getting their foot in the door to do corporate narrations for oil and gas and for other industries that are dominated or have been up to, say, the last 20 years by a male executive, male executive or yeah. a predominantly male clientele, mm-hmm. or at least that, that, that being the perception. Mm-hmm. And so what tends to happen, and this is an interesting gauge for you, if, if you ever notice, if there's a huge crisis in the world, so and I'll use 9-11 as a good example, when there's a crisis in the world, it seems that people want a reassuring kind of authoritative voice. And in the Western world, that voice tends to be older sounding and male. Mm-hmm. Um, as we ease our way back to some sense of stability, the female voices start to creep back in and all of the stereotypical adjectives that you'd hear apply to either gender apply. You have mm. a more nurturing sound that is typical of a lot of female voices, mm. uh, a more maternal, a more protective, um, a more, you know, a safer sound. Mm. Um, and then when you have, uh, you'd have the same thing for in reverse for things like in car audio, because nobody wants to hear a man say, Hey, dude, your door is ajar. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, actually. All of my, and others you mentioned it, all of the voices, I automated voices I personally surround myself with. So this is on, um, on Siri, on Alexa, on Google, um, mm-hmm. are all female. Yeah. And, and uh, there's a reason why those voices came first. Yeah. And there's a reason why in, you'll see that Apple and Android have deployed uh, both genders, but in some cultures, you'll find that it's predominantly it's one male or the other. Female, yeah, exactly. Interesting, interesting uh, question. Well, we we uh, we landed uh, obviously with you um, and uh, delighted with the with the result uh, of that um, uh, of the work that we put together. So very pleased there. Uh, but uh, tell me, and I I shared with you as you may remember what, back then. I, s- I sent the text over, and um, because you know uh, the oil and gas industry is um, is these days it's in the media, but not for good reasons. Usually, there's a, the the act a- anti oil movement is is very strong. Uh, people are deeply concerned about the impact of uh, climate change and and the the contribution that fossil fuels are making to that um, that that uh, uh, evolutionary process. Um, so not everybody would want to associate, associate themselves with this book. Um, but, but so curiously, why, why did you want to record it? I mean, you had a, you've got choices. You, you, you could yeah. politely say, look, I'm really busy. I'd like to do it. But, but instead you said, no, I'd like to do this book. Why? So why, what's your thinking there? Uh, there were a few things. One is that I do believe that, uh, the industry is, uh, unbelievably important to Canada's economy. And I think it's been, um, to some extent, especially in Canada, unfairly demonized on a number of different levels. Mm. Uh, There's no doubt. I think you and I probably grew up in roughly the same era where most of our sci-fi books were that we would be uh, using jetpacks. Everything would be solar power. uh, There would be, you know, no pollution. We'd all have, you know, six out of seven days off, that kind of thing. The jets. Um, But the reality is not that. And the reality is that we need a dense source of energy to power Western based economies. And other than coal, natural gas, and then oil, um, there just have not been sources that have been as reliable or abundant. So hydro in the East, certainly, Mm -hmm. and you've got nuclear in some spots, but there's a resistance to that now politically. Um, but oil and gas in, in Canada is a well-monitored, well-policed industry, and there's just really not the same kind of reason to attack the Canadian industry that there might be in some other places where there genuinely isn't a concern uh, with mm. human rights, with pollution, with the outcomes. Mm. In, in my, my personal history, and it's only anecdotal compared to yours, is that since the oil sands were exploited, They've done nothing but make the technology cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. That's not to say that you're not going to leave scars on an environment when you're doing mining. Mm. Um, But that is, in all honesty, that is sometimes the price to pay for having a society that is powered the way that ours is. And I've read all kinds of different books. Bill Gates um, is a huge fan of a a University of Manitoba energy professor named Vaclav Smeal. And um, anybody who reads a few of his books, including... Um, energy and civilization and history will understand that where energy flows, civilization often follows. And civilization in the sense that we know it with human rights, uh, agglomerations in cities, uh, people thriving in all kinds of different ways. So I wanted that. And then the other component for me, Jeffrey, honestly, was that I attend so many networking events in here in Calgary that 
Um, I just wanted to be better informed. And I knew that your book would be a terrific way to do it. And I mingle with both tech folks and oil and gas folks. And I just thought this is going to give me a lever into conversations with both ends of that spectrum. Always, no uh, problem. always good to sound a, a little, just a, just a touch uh, smarter on, on what is a pretty hot topic. Oh yeah. Cause we can be co- consummate generalists, right? And you can get in a lot of trouble very quickly. <laughs> very yeah. So tell us uh, how the process actually works. So I, I mean, I, what I did was I sent you the, the manuscript in, in right. PDF format and, um, and then uh, wait three weeks and out pops uh, uh, two gigabytes of recorded audio. So how, did, how did we, how did we go from, from uh, that PDF to, to, to the audio? How does it actually work? Uh, it's a, actually a fascinating process in, from my end, only because I had only really, I've, although I do a lot of long form narration, whether it's television or documentary or a lot of e-learning, um, reading an audiobook is very, very specific. So I tapped a friend of mine here in the market. Her name is Don Harvey, and she's read over 60 books. Mm. And she gave me her spreadsheets, which had uh, various tabs. And you and I both worked with these. You know, we mm. were able to, for example, journal all of the corrections that were required where I might have said a word incorrectly or things like that. Um, so I pre-read the book, and I pre-read it twice. And as I went through the PDF that you sent me, um, I marked my own notes, my own comments on the margins. So there were a couple of, you know, what the heck moments when I couldn't believe that somebody would actually question some of the things that you were saying. Mm. Um, there were quite a few moments like that in the book where I thought, how are they not getting this? Um, but <laughs> there, so there were moments like that. And so I would draw a smiley face where I had to have a smile. I would, uh, you know, I would make a point of saying I would write in the margin this, that, or the other thing. Mm. Um, the engineering was done by a gentleman named Jason Lawrence, who is a dialogue editor here in Calgary, who has worked on TV series like Fargo. And I just knew that once I had done my thing, I could hand him the audio and he would be able to clean things up and make it pristine for you. Mm. Um, so the process was I would go in, I would record for three hours at a time. I would usually end up with one to one and a half hours of finished audio. And as you know, the book is 10 and a half hours long. Yep. So I would just send the audio to Jason. He would clean it up. You would review. I would get corrections. We would then get the corrections. And then we'd send those back to make sure that we approved. And there we go. So when, so, when people are listening to the audio version, they're hearing, they're hearing a finished, and, and literally you could break this down to the sentence level. They're he- hearing a recorded sentence, which you probably recorded two times before you got to the the recorded sentence is that is that the way to think about it? In other words, you actually had to read the book three times to get to the one, the the the, the one recorded sentence. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. What, what tends to happen is you. It's one thing to read it in your head once. The second time, I read it kind of out loud to myself. Hmm. Um, and so what that does is it almost gives your mouth and your brain a bit of a muscle memory as you come to certain sections of the book. But certain sections of the book, you know, stick more than others for whatever reason. And so those pieces were easy. I'd be able to navigate through paragraphs of text without any kind of stumbling or errors. But there were times when you develop three voices for the audiobook, um, which is what Don's recommendation was. You have the author's voice, which is obviously I'm trying to capture you and Rachel. And then you have the person who has to read out the quotes and almost assume a bit of a personality of the person who's who's responsible for the quote. And then you have the title person. You know, he's kind of your host. <laughs> ah, right. Who reads and, off the titles, the subtitles and so forth. Absolutely. To get you and so it was like, you know. every once in a while, uh, the narrator, I would stumble and think, I don't think I did, did Jeffrey and Rachel justice here. I, I need to go back and either it was emphasis or... Um, actual emotion. Um, and there were quite a few times you had a lot of humor in the book, considering that it could have been probably a lot drier. Um, <laughs> but there was a lot dry. of humor in the book. And even if it's just thinking back to that section where you, you recount how you used to travel and it used to be so much simpler. Now you've got cords out the Wahoo and you've mm. got appliances and everything else. Well, that's an experience that everybody has. And so I wanted to be your voice, but also be the voice of every person that is in that boat traveling now for business. Fantastic. Well, listen, let, let's uh, let's actually take a listen to the uh, a sample um, from it. And then at the end of the sample, um, we'll pick back up because I have a few more questions for you. So let, have a listen to everyone to the sample. Introduction. The oil and gas industry is well known for its boom and bust cycle. As the wells peter out, Demand continues to rise, ensuring the next boom. In 2008, 
prices collapsed from well over $100 per barrel to as low as $30, only to resume the climb to $100 per barrel again by 2014, as demand grew to 95 million barrels per day. But now, the global oil and gas industry is truly at a crossroads. For the first time in many decades, the confluence of a number of forces is flattening out the growth in petroleum, particularly for transportation. Rapidly advancing alternatives in drivetrain technology, including hybrid and electric motors, dramatically better renewable energy sources and battery technologies, shifting consumer preferences towards shared vehicles, and a global movement to decarbonize look poised to exert unrelenting downward pressure. These changes vary immensely from country to country, with some smaller European nations aiming to fully eliminate fossil fuels from their power mix. China has explicitly set out in its latest five-year plan its intent to be a global leader in renewable energy, battery technology, and new transportation technologies, while still presenting a strong growth prospect for petroleum consumption. Other large nations, such as India, also provide ample opportunity for growth. For many oil producers, the standard playbook for managing the down cycle of the commodity market has run its course. Procurement teams have mercilessly squeezed the supply chain and extracted painful price concessions. Management teams have high-graded capital budgets and now only chase the best opportunities. Several hundred thousand jobs have been eliminated from the industry, mostly from the ranks of the service companies and engineering firms. Bankruptcies have peaked and boards have replaced their CEOs. Cost reduction efforts have now brought the industry to a level of profitability that exceeds the level when oil prices peaked in 2014. Royal Dutch Shell's reported 2018 first quarter results show the company making as much profit at $60 per barrel as it did when oil was $100 per barrel. Goldman Sachs also reported in early 2017 that European oil companies generated the same amount of cash at $52 per barrel as they did at $109. Meanwhile, actual and potential supplies of hydrocarbons are rising at a remarkable rate. The industry has successfully adopted technological innovations that have caused a permanent swing from peak oil to superabundance. In response, Many global producers in 2015 and 2016 set out to maximize their production to maintain market share. Prices have dropped from historic highs of more than $100 per barrel to record lows of $28, only to slowly climb back up. As I write this passage in mid-2018, the price of oil is still just $67 per barrel. Well, that uh, gives you a sense as to what the audiobook sounds like. And uh, I'm now back with uh, Paul and wanted to follow up with just a couple of more questions. Um, and and uh, for you, Paul, what did, what did you learn about the process of, of actually recording the book? How is it different, say, from recording, uh, doing a, a, a corporate uh, training video or a, um, a trailer for a, for, a, for a movie? Well, I have to tell you, it's the first time I've actually sat down to record anything since the 80s. <laughs> I stand for all of my recording, and the reason for that is I don't have one of these James Earl Jones voices, so I want to use the whole instrument, including my diaphragm, so I stand uh -huh. to get all of that emphasis and being able to move my hands and speak and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I sat for this, and it's funny, you when we did the first round of corrections, there were a few that you noticed really stood out, mm -hmm. and the reason that they stood out was because I actually had not reset the booth into the sitting narrator position for the book. As soon as I did that, the corrections went much more smoothly, yeah, smoothly and I was able yeah, to recapture that feeling and that voice. Yeah. Um, and then I was just honestly surprised by the prep time. If you think about reading a book twice, once um, just in your head, the second time out loud, and then a third time after you've annotated the thing, um, the prep time for the book probably was almost, I, I don't know, I, I, between 20 and 30 hours. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think and, to to really to really get across the topic and be able to communicate it and express it in a in that fashion, I I I, I don't understand how you could uh, just read the text without actually having taken the time to absorb what it's trying to communicate. Uh, so that I think that's a really important observation for people out there. Is there's, the, there's the voice narration you're listening to uh, probably isn't as simple as pick up a piece of paper and start reading. It really does mean you're immersing yourself into the work, almost like an actor does, I suspect. Well, and I, I have to salute actors who do a lot of uh, fiction audiobooks because their prep time is even more intensive. They will read the book once to get kind of the narrator arc of the story, mm. perhaps the protagonist, and then they have to go through and kind of figure out who the other people are. And as they're going through, although they're not going to change their voice necessarily, mm. they will have to change emphasis, intonation, and emotion a lot of the times to address different characters and then lead you, the person who's listening, back into a piece of narrative text that has no dialogue. It's it's complicated. So nonfiction in that sense um, is simpler, but it was, it was, you still, there's a lot of respect involved too. I respect for you two, uh, respect for the people who are listening, respect for people who are listening who may differ in their opinions about what's happening in the industry and for those who are sympathetic um, and who really need to get uh, an understanding of what, how the industry functions so they can get in there. Now that you've been through it, uh, what anything that stood out for you or any surprises for you? As I mean, most people will read the book once, but you've read it three, four times and you've narrated yeah. it. So you're much closer to it. Uh, what stood out for you uh, in the topic area? I loved the way that you and Rachel broke out a much, a very prescriptive sort of approach. At the very beginning of the book, um, you said, identify your area of interest. So for example, if you're coming at it from tech or if you're coming at it from oil and gas and um, but understand that you can actually kind of hop through and kind of pick and choose what you'd like to read. Um, but I loved how definite, and I I thought it was not only definite, but solidly plausible based on what I know about the technology that you were talking about. Um, when you gave windows and the bangs and the, the, so the potential impact and the timeline to that impact for each of the different pieces of the industry we talked about. Mm. Those were my favorite sections of the book because there were a couple of surprises there in the sense that, um, you know, there, there's no question that when people read this, they think, oh, displacement, where, you know, there are going to be jobs lost. Um, and for sure, there are going to be jobs lost, but there are many opportunities created by this technology. And I like the balance that you struck in the book. Um, not necessarily in pointing people out, but if you have any idea on how to do something better, perhaps you've worked in the industry before and you moved away from it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you act in a consultant capacity or perhaps you're just on the technical side. It's just you can get insight into the industry from the outside looking in that will allow you to listen better um, rather than just tell tech, tell oil and gas people what to do, mm. which isn't going to be received very well. No, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's not received very well in mm. any industry. But mm. And then for oil and gas people, I think what you did was you made it, you made everything so palatable because you explained it in such detail that that was one of my favorite things about it. And Jason, our audio editor, said the same thing. He loved the way you outlined the specific technology, the timeline to impact, and then the potential and likely impacts and some of the impacts that you're already seeing. Yeah. So those, those were for sure some of my favorite things. And I would, I would tell people, go ahead, follow Jeffrey's prescription at the beginning, follow your area of interest, but then go back and read the other sections. You'll pick something up that's really valuable. Yeah, I think that the value there is, uh, in my mind, was to help people who are working in one part of the industry to appreciate the, the ch challenges that uh, uh, other parts of the industry are facing. In our, in our personal lives, we, you know, we, we, uh, we see the, um, the pressure in the automotive industry now worldwide to uh, transition away from combustion engine technology to electrification of, of the drivetrain. And, um, and so you, you, we, we, we read about that and we see it. And, um, but what does that mean if you're uh, someone who's working in the exploration sector? How do you, how do you connect that to your day-to-day? -day and what does, it, what does it actually mean? So the book actually tries to set out to answer that question for, for people who work up and down the supply chain. Well, and you also exposed one of the areas that is most rife for disruption, which is the siloing of information, data, and people in mm -hmm. the different segments of the industry. All that stuff is going to get blown up. And I think that the book makes it very, very clear how those things are going to happen. I, that's one of the great things about technology, even in my business, is how it has opened up the world to anyone from anywhere. 
Mm-hmm. And so these little silos are gone. You have to reach out, create cooperative, collaborative networks. And I, I love the way there is a there's a segment where you're talking about blockchain and blockchain contracts and mm-hmm. how it will facilitate payment based on thresholds and, and different pieces and the smart contract idea. Mm-hmm. Those are notions that the oil and gas industry would would really be uh, remiss if they didn't pay attention to because it will serve their vendors better mm-hmm. and it will serve them better uh, in the end. Yeah. So um, the, the, there's a, the, the range of benefits potential there is, is, is pretty staggering and it's coming it very, is. very quickly. Yeah. Uh, any advice for anyone who's listening to this uh, book, anything that the, you know, this, the things that they should be really attentive to. I mean, if, yeah, since you've had a chance to <laughs> go through it so many times, what, anything you'd point people to? I'd say take notes. Um, it's funny. There was an article that came out the other day written, uh, it's, I think it came out of the Telegraph in the UK that talked about how uh, audiobooks, which are sometimes, people, you know, people, big readers sometimes kind of look down their nose at audiobooks, but they stimulate the same passages in the brain. Hmm. But people do remember things in a very different way. Maybe they're more, my son, for example, is a very tactile learner. So if he touches the words, he'll remember things. So if you have the luxury of being in a spot where you're listening to the book, um, See if you can mark the passage. I would go back, listen to it again. If you've got a great memory, terrific. If you don't, take notes because there are lots of immediately applicable prescriptive pieces of advice in the book that I think a lot of people would benefit from applying quickly. That's fantastic. Paul, it's been a real pleasure working with you and Jason, by the way, in, in putting this uh, this this book together, audiobook and uh I uh, just wanted to thank you again for uh, your your contribution and efforts to the cause uh, and appreciate you taking the time to share with us today your your um, uh, perspectives around uh, the recording industry and how it works so that others uh, out there can get a sense as to what, what goes on behind the scenes. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. It was a privilege. Uh, this has been um, another episode of Bits, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Digital Oil and Gas, not Bits, Bites, and Bro. I should rename the podcast now that I think about it. Uh, Digital Oil and Gas. And uh, join me again uh, next week uh, for another episode. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil and Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.